take your Bible this morning and find John's gospel in chapter number 11. John chapter 11, we are concluding today a series, a teaching series, as we've been making our way through the signs found in John's gospel. There are many, many miracles that Jesus performed during his earthly ministry, but John records seven main miracles. He calls them signs. What do signs do? Signs point to something. And these signs, these miracles, they point ever increasingly to, the, to who Jesus was, who Jesus is, speaking primarily, to, primarily of, his, of his deity, Jesus being God, Jesus being the Christ, the Savior, the Lord. And this morning, we come to that last sign that Jesus records in John chapter 11 of the seven miracles. This probably, you're like me, this, this may be your, your favorite. And just like last week, there's lots of verses that we must read together. I'll try to skip through or skip over some, but it's important that we really understand the entire story and context of this miracle. And I want to invite you this morning, if you would, to stand for this initial reading of God's Word. In John chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Verse 11, and after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll, he'll recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant simply rest in sleep. But then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Verse 17, now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and she met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And anyone who lives, he believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe? Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. Verse 32, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother, my brother would not have died. 
When Jesus saw her weeping and he saw the Jews that had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. But Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes. And he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but... I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out. His hands and his feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him. Loose him, let him go. And that's what happened. Amen. You may be seated. But can I encourage you to take out a pencil or a pen, something you can write with. And there are just a few things that I want us to think about together as we make our way through this incredible, this glorious, this magnificent passage of Scripture. And the first thing that I want you to do, if you feel comfortable, is right in the margin of your Bible, this phrase, the shadow of death. The shadow of death. What Mary and Martha did in requesting Jesus to come was, was a pretty bold thing for them to do. Bethany is close to Jerusalem, but where Jesus and his disciples were, they were about a day's journey, maybe a little bit more. But Mary and Martha sent word to the Lord saying, the one you love, Lazarus and Jesus, they were such dear friends. Lazarus loved Jesus, Jesus loved Lazarus. This friend that you love dearly is dying. It's a bold thing because in that area of Bethany, it was dangerous for Jesus. As a matter of fact, you might as well put it this way, there was a bounty on his head. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't wise for Jesus to go to Bethany. So this was a bold request that Mary and Martha made, but they made the request because of the, the hurt, because of the anxiety, because of the fear. You see, Mary and Martha we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. That, that great psalm that you and I are so familiar with, the 23rd Psalm, it speaks of that, right? Although, although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what I want you to see and what I want you to understand this morning before we even dive really specifically into these verses is for you to understand this. Anytime death is near, the shadow of death is near. Now it could be a, a physical death and I would say this and if you've lived any length of time you know this to be true but as you live your life you will undoubtedly go through the shadow of death. Sometimes it's the dying or the death of a loved one. Some of you know the pain. You know of the darkness of, of losing someone that you love. Sometimes it's a, it's a death of, a, of someone that you love. Sometimes it's a physical death, but sometimes it's a death of a relationship. For some of you, you have gone through the, 
the shadow of death, the death of a friendship. Some of you absolutely know the valley of the shadow of death because you have gone through the death of a marriage. There is a shadow. There is a darkness that that covers us when death is near. A physical death, an emotional death, a a relational death. It could be not just the death of a marriage, it could be the death of a dream. Some of you know exactly what that's like, the death of a dream. Some of you know what it's like when you hear about the decisions that your son has been making or the decisions that your daughter has been making that's ruining their life and you know the shadow that that brings. So what I want you to understand is that Mary and Martha, they were going through the shadow of death. And it's in their their heartbreak And it's in their heartache that they reach out to Jesus. The reason I share this with you is that there are some of you here this morning, there are some of you that are watching online, and at this very moment you are traveling, you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. When death is near, it casts a shadow. And you know exactly what that's like. So understand the context of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But what I want you and I to spend the bulk of our time on this morning is just walking through the response of Jesus. Because as Jesus responds to the news that his best friend, the one that he cares about, the one that he loves is dying, noticing how he responds, how he responds to the news, how he responds in his timing, how he responds to Martha, how he responds to Mary, reveals so much about who he is. I told you that John calls these the signs because they point to something. You and I are going to see in Jesus' And his response, we're going to see so much about Jesus. The first thing that we learn about him is this. Jesus is in control. He is sovereign. Jesus, know this. He is in control. He is sovereign. Go back to verse number four. Verse number four says, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. And so that the son of God may be glorified through it. In other words, when Jesus received this news, he declared to his disciples, there is a reason, there is a purpose for this. So what I want you to see and what I want you to understand this morning, regardless of what you're facing, regardless of what you're enduring, Jesus is in control and in his sovereignty, there is a purpose for what you're facing. There is a purpose for what you're going through. So I would say that if you are in the midst of the shadow, invite God, invite Jesus to be a part of it. Because if you will invite him to join you in it, then there's a purpose. He says to his disciples, there's a purpose in this. There's a purpose for this shadow. The purpose for this particular shadow is that God may be glorified and the Son of God, the Son of Man may may be glorified. You see what it reminds me of? It reminds me of John chapter one. In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the next verse, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. If you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, invite God in. And in inviting him in, know that there is a purpose. There is a purpose for that shadow. That's what he tells us in verse number four, but then he continues on in verse number five. He tells us in verse number five, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister 
and Lazarus. You ought to underline that word loved. He loved Martha, loved Mary, loved Lazarus. The next verse, verse number six. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Let's stay here for a second. Notice this word, so. Isn't it interesting that it does not say this? Jesus loved Martha. Jesus loved Mary. Jesus loved Lazarus, but he stayed two additional days. That's not what it says. It says that he loved Martha, he loved Mary, he loved Lazarus, so he stayed two additional days. For some reason, his love for Lazarus compelled him to wait. Now, what I'm saying to you is this. In that shadow, that shadow of death, there is a purpose. There is a purpose for the shadow. There is a purpose for the delays. There is a purpose for the timing. There is a purpose for the waiting. So I want you to picture. I want you to picture as Jesus delayed, I want you to picture Martha and Mary. They sent word to Jesus. The one you love is dying and I want you to picture that day after day, hour after hour, Martha and Mary by the bedside of Lazarus. Mary, look out the window. Mary, do you see him? Jesus, where are you? Day after day, do, do you see him? What do you think is keeping him? Where is he? Day after day after day, and then even in those last moments in which Lazarus breathes his last breath, Jesus, where were you? No. Know that when you can't understand his timing, understand you can't, you can't fully grasp his plan, know, know that his delays are for a purpose. There, there's a purpose in the delays. There's a purpose for the shadows. Know that Jesus is in control. He is sovereign. Even when you may not fully grasp it, he is in control. Maybe for no other reason, God brought you here this morning to hear this, he's in control. You may not get it, but he's sovereign. Number one, Jesus is in control, he's sovereign. Number two, Jesus cares. He is sympathetic. It's kind of interesting to me how Jesus responds to Mary and Martha. It's also fascinating to me that both Mary and Martha, when they do see Jesus, they, they say the same thing. Almost word for word, both Martha and Mary, when they see Jesus, they say to him, if you just would have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. So you, 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 you get a sense of the feelings here, right? You get a sense of the, of the grief, the pain, even really a bit of accusation. If you would have been here, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. That, that's the thing about grief, isn't it? Grief, grief removes the filter. There are times when I've been around people who are grieving and they just say what's ever on their mind. And that's Mary and that's Martha. Jesus waits. The Bible says even though he loves them, he waits. And then he begins making his way. The Bible says he gets on the outskirts of, of Bethany and Martha gets word that he's coming. She leaves Mary, or Mary refuses because Mary's angry. And Martha comes, and Martha says, if you just would have been here. Then as he makes his way, then Mary comes. And I want you to notice, and I want you to see how he responds to Mary in verse number 33, 
And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had once, who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit. You ought to underline this phrase in your Bible. He was deeply moved in his spirit. This is an English phrase, but it's actually only one word in the Greek. This is interesting. In other places in the New Testament, that one Greek word is translated outraged or furious. Picture this. Jesus is making his way, and he sees Mary, and he sees the other people who are, who are grieving. They're weeping, the pain, the heartache, and Jesus is outraged. He's so angry. Why is he so, why is he so filled with fury? Because the author of life is now confronting the sadness and the ugliness of death. And the Bible says he's, he's deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Mark Buchanan, I love his writings. Mark Buchanan put it this way, that one line is the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus weeps at the tomb of Lazarus, his friend, the one he loves. Never has so much theology been so clearly distilled as here. The fullness of the incarnation, Christ coming among us to be with us, to be one with us is gathered up and pressed into a single subject and verb. Here is love, mercy, passion, compassion, grief, and anger over our condition, our frailty, our vulnerability, chiseled down to two words. Jesus wept. When you are walking through the shadow of death, know that God weeps with you. Know that our Lord hurts with you. As you grieve, he is grieving. And so too, Mary, he gives tears and he grieves. But notice the other response. Go back to his response with Martha, beginning in verse 23. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Look up here for a second. This is so good. To Mary, he gives his tears. To Martha, he gives his truth. I love what Tim Keller says about this. He calls it the ministry of tooth, uh, truth and the ministry of tears. There are some times in which when you are helping someone when you are with a friend that is grieving, that is going through the shadow of death, what they need from you is truth. They need you to speak truth into their life, God's truth, to remind them that this is not it, that this is not the end, to remind them of life and life eternal, to remind them of God's goodness and God's grace and his love and his mercy. There are some times when you are with your friend, what they need is the ministry of truth. But there are some friends, they're not quite ready for the truth. And really what they need is for you simply to show up and weep with them. What they need from you is the ministry of tears. He loves these women so much. These two women. 
He cared so much about these two women that he gave both of them exactly what they needed in that moment. For one tears and for the other truth. Jesus cares. He is sympathetic. Jesus is in control. He is sovereign. But know this, Jesus conquers. He is supreme. So he arrives on the scene and he says, roll away the stone. Notice Martha's response. But Lord, he's been dead for four days. There's an odor. This is one of those verses, by the way, that I prefer the King James. Because the old King James says, Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> Jesus said, roll away the stone. Lord, he stinketh. And then what does he say? Do you believe? And they rolled away the stone. Lazarus! And the reason he said Lazarus' name is because all the dead folks would have come out. <laughs> so he had to be specific. Amen? Lazarus! Come forth. And he came out, the dead, dead man, dead man walking. His hands, his feet bound, his head in grave cloths. Jesus said, loose him, let him go. Take off his dead, take off his grave clothes. He's not going to need them. We don't have a lot of details here, but I'm going to tell you what I believe. Because Jesus loved him. And Lazarus loved Jesus. And he'd already been weeping. I believe there was an embrace. I believe there was a hug. I believe there were tears. This time of joy. Because his friend is alive again. Jesus conquers. What, what you need to know as a, as a takeaway this morning is this truth. Death is a reality. Death is a shadow, but it is just a shadow. Jesus wins. Every single time, Jesus wins. Amen? One last thing, and then we need to prepare for the Lord's Supper. The ultimate question. I don't know if you picked up on this as I was reading through the chapter. There is a theme that runs all through John chapter 11. When Jesus received news of Lazarus dying, he says to his disciples in verse number five, uh, verse number 15, and for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may say it, believe. The Bible says that just before uh, he raised Lazarus back to life, the Bible says he stood before the tomb and he prayed. And as he prayed, Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. You remember what he said to Martha? Remember what he said to Martha? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha, do you believe? The ultimate question, the most important question that every single person on this planet will have to answer, do you believe? This morning, we have made our way through the seven incredible miracles performed by Jesus. We have studied them in great detail. And the question that I have for you this morning is, do you believe? What is, what is he asking you to do? If you believe, 
roll away the stone. If you believe, step out of the boat. What is it that he's calling you to do? You've seen testimony this morning of where the Lord called people to be baptized publicly, to declare their faith publicly. There are some of you who need to declare your faith publicly. There are some of you who need to begin the journey of faith by trusting and believing in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, by faith, believing what he did for you 2,000 years ago on the cross. There are some of you right now that are in the shadow of death, Do you believe that he is sovereign, that he cares, that he ultimately will conquer? Have you trusted and do you believe and do you walk in that? If you believe, roll away the stone. If you believe, step out of the boat. Today, this morning, let's pray together. Your head is bowed, your eyes are closed. Our worship team is gonna come. They're gonna lead us in just a a bit of a song. In fact, I'm gonna ask our pastors to come stand here at the front. Pastor Lonnie's gonna be here. Pastor Ronnie. Pastors standing here. Pastor Jim is here. Listen, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to pray for you. But do you believe the altar is open for you to kneel and confess and trust, to cast that burden? You're walking through the shadow of death. Invite him to join you so that there is purpose in the shadow and purpose in the waiting. Stand with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, there are so many, Lord, I know that are burdened this morning. There are so many that are in this room and there are so many that are watching online and they are even at this very moment, they are walking through the shadow of death. And they perhaps are like Mary or Martha and they're wondering where you are. But I pray that today in this place, They would trust your sovereignty. They would trust your goodness. They would trust your purpose. The purpose for the shadow and the purpose for the waiting. I pray for these today who need to take a step. They need to step out from the boat. They need to roll away the stone. So I pray that in these moments, what you see in this room is people believing, people trusting. Hear us in these moments as we pray, as we cry out to you. In Christ's name, amen. You come.